an honor to be here and to talk about the relationship of linguistics, and especially corpus linguistics, with related fields that are more data-centric, like um, computational linguistics and language data science. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is about the relationships between these fields, how we can build bridges, and what dangers there are if we're drifting apart. So to give you some background about what motivated me to give this talk, right? So um, both at um, UIT, the Arctic University in Norway, and at the University of Queensland, uh, I'm working in labs or with labs, um, which means that people come to me and I consult with them on issues relating to data management, uh, research design, statistics. Um, and what I realized is that even if you look at really top researchers, so we're really talking about people who are fully established, they're people that I look up to, and their research is absolutely outstanding, if you look at their computers, sometimes they tend to be a little bit messy, right? So, and I think we can all agree that uh, our computers are, to a certain extent, a little bit messy. So that is something that is actually quite, quite interesting to me, because it shows that while we have put up um, an infrastructure for dealing with language data, and we've basically, we are, as corpus linguists, a result of the empirical turn, we haven't really focused on data management and how to organize our workflows and make our, um, make our computers and our folder structures and how we work more tidy, right? So it's inherently messy. And now, issues that people struggle with when they consult with me is, for example, what, what, is, the, what is the problem, right? So finding out what the problem or the issue is could be a first step in basically addressing what's going on, how can I help people? Of course, sometimes people come to me, they have this kind of data set, and then they ask, okay, what can I do with this, right? That would be one type of question that I'm faced with. Also, uh, people show me how they work, so it's very intimate because they show me their computers, which is something that you typically would not do. And you see that sometimes the workflows are not quite optimal, right? So they're a little convoluted, it's a little messy. Um, and then I help them to basically improve the workflows, but also to tidy data, to basically come up with uh, ways that make it easier for researchers to deal and handle data. In addition, of course, uh, people come to me and ask uh, about statistics and statistical advice. So there might be a method that they'd like to use, and they talk with me about that. And sometimes I can help, with, uh, help them with that. Also, an issue that I'm faced with is that, especially in corpus linguistics, there are a lot of tasks that we do manually that we can also automate and make easier or more efficient using computation, right? Now, but when we talk about statistics, especially, if you look at our field, we have a well-established infrastructure on dealing with statistics. So there are several books on the topic. Um, you all know them, probably. It's uh, Stefan Gries and Bodo Winters and Natalia Leschinas, but also Gero Schneider's um, book on statistics, which are highly recommendable, right? So we have sort of this infrastructure in terms of just things you can read. You can also check out websites or attend boot camps, and there are different ways that we can uh, essentially skill up in this domain, right? Now, the problem is that when it comes to data management or programming or issues relating to re reproducibility, we do not have that infrastructure. It's really just not there, right? So my aim in this talk is essentially to talk about this gap, the lack of resources, what we can take from other domains where uh, resources are available, and then also talk about problems that might arise if we do that. That basically is a background to, to, my, uh, to my talk today. And as a first step, I'd like to talk about something that we're all affected by, which is the computational revolution, um, or the computing revolution, as it's also called, and then talk about um, potentials that the revolution bears for us, but also to talk about potential drawbacks, right? Because as linguists, we focus on language, and we try to understand language, and so our focus is not necessarily on the data itself, right? It's, it's the topic that we're interested in, not, from, and not the methodology to a certain extent. I'll then talk about replication crises, or problem, or issue, whatever you want to call it. Um, in our workshop that took place earlier uh, this week, we actually thought well, we're not in a crisis yet, but we definitely see that there's a problem, that there, uh, that there is an issue. And then I'll talk about, give some case studies about uh, infrastructures that are being set up as we speak, that are there to a certain extent. And I'd also like to show you a case study that shows not only what we can take from computational fields, like uh, computational linguistics or other data-heavy sciences, uh, but also how we can contribute. That's, to me, very important, that we can show it's not actually that we steal from them and we are the beggars that want something from someone else, but we actually have a better understanding of how language works. 
And that's something that is very important and where we can actually contribute something. And I'm going to talk about case study that we did on uh, the COVID-19 discourse in Australia. Finally, <laughs> I'll offer some wild speculations uh, about what I think is going on and how these issues could develop in the future, what we can do to avoid uh, issues. All right, so computation is definitely becoming more prevalent in all ways of life. If you think back to the 1980s when I was born, uh, <laughs> Uh, you could not basically order food via your computer or book travels. So you'd have to go to a store and then do that there, right? And if you look at today's situation, especially in corona times, you're aware that lots of aspects of your life are influenced by computing, right? So the computation revolution, I think, is uncontroversial, has affected all domains of life. Also, uh, computational approaches to working with data, meaning data extraction and processing, uh, analysis, visualization, have increasingly become more uh, important in our field, so in corpus linguistics. So I'll talk about basically how the, the quantitative term that it has called has affected corpus linguistics. And despite the quantitative term, so the fact that statistical methods are becoming more and more prevalent in our field, that is not to the same extent true for a computational term, right? So when you look at basically statistical methods, they've increased in frequency but it's not the same for uh, programming or computational skills, right? So there, I think, uh, not only our field, but the humanities overall have remained to a certain extent more, uh, extent more traditional. And while we have integrated um, basically training on tools and how to do corpus linguistics with, with uh, certain digital methods, uh, I think that there's room for improvement, right? So that is something that I would like to, uh, like to talk about, especially uh, what what we can profit or how we can profit from by doing that, right? Um, here, I just want to give you an overview of computational methods and um, essentially where language data plays a role. And you see that in the biggest companies and the most important things that we do in the internet, language data plays a critical role. So if you think about Google and search, en uh, search engines, it's very apparent. That's essentially distributional semantics to a certain extent. So it's something that we as corpus linguists understand and where we basically have laid the groundwork for a lot of these processes that have uh, enabled other people in the world to basically make their lives easier and better, right? Now, but to a certain extent, we as corpus linguists have also ignored that, right? So we've given that over to uh, software engineers and people who do computering. Right? Um, so we're, we're a little bit left behind. Um, but you should not leave anyone behind. So let's talk about that, right? Because as corpus linguistics, um, we can consider ourselves an offshoot of the quantitative revolution or the, the computational revolution. Because essentially, corpus linguistics emerged out of that um, phase where computerized texts became available. And now, when, when that happened, People have the chance to test ideas and models using natural language data. So in essence, corpus linguistics is a child of the computational revolution. Right? Um, Lawrence Anthony published a chapter on programming in uh, corpus linguistics last year. And he differentiated between three different phases in the development of corpus linguistics with respect to programming. I'd like to add a fourth. But the first three phases are essentially in the 1960s, people started to use computers to extract concordances, right? And as that matured, um, basically people developed tools, for example, Lawrence um, Ancon Empire, uh, that many people use here. Um, so tools became available that enabled people to um, basically use um, corpora in a way where they would not have to do programming. So that was shift away from the first period, or first phase, when people basically could only use corpora when they could pr do programming, right? Uh, to a, a period when there was more use for tools. So a step away from programming to tool use. And then with the 2000s, basically web-based corpora became more prevalent and we have these user interfaces. So you could say that basically since the 1980s and uh, programs that we can use to analyze text, programming has become less important over time, right? Now, there's a fourth phase. Um, and we can't disagree on when that started, 
where uh, statistics and quantification and frequencies became more important, not only in terms of um, the data itself, but also in terms of theory building, right? Like probabilistic grammars um, or conditional probabilities, right? So you can say that there's a fourth phase when we experience a quantitative turn, but there wasn't really a computational turn, right? And if there was a computational turn, it was just piggybacking on the back of statistics, right? So we've integrated statistics, but we haven't integrated programming. Right? because we can still use the web-based tools and the, the tools that are available to us. Now, what is the potential of doing programming despite there being these tools? Right? Um, now, I think that as a field, we can profit from using computation or programming um, because we can use methods that are just difficult to implement when you can't do programming. One example, but there are many others, would be Mopdarf, uh, which was developed by Stefan Gries and others, um, where you basically have the option to determine how would a person have reacted um, in a certain environment, right? So you don't compare groups, but you think about, well, if I take a person from this group, for example, a learner group, how would they have reacted um, given certain uh, con uh, configurations in the data, right? And then compare that to the actual behavior of, of um, for example, uh, L1 speakers. Also, computation offers, of us, uh, offers us the opportunity to use big data, so massive data sets that you just you know, fail to be able to use when you don't do programming. So you not only have the option to use innovative methods, but you can also basically tap into data sets that, would not be able to, uh, that you would not be able to use before. In addition, that is less related to programming, but more related to practices that are prevalent in computational uh, linguistics or in language data science, you can make use of platforms and practices for collaboration. Uh, and that is also something. We still tend to sit there in our offices and do our research, right? And when you look at the natural uh, sciences, so STEM, there's much more calm that people really work in teams and you have a division of labor, right? And that, these are processes that are just more common in STEM and computational fields. Um, and my main point for today is that when you use computation and programming, you can make your workflows fully transparent and fully replicable, because every step of an analysis, going from extracting the data to processing the data, from sorting data, visualizing it, and analyzing it, become replicable at the press of a button. Right? Now, potential drawbacks of that are obviously that, well, that would mean that we would have to cut time from looking at language and linguistics to basically looking more at methodology. So we'd become, um, basically, we'd, we'd move towards engineering and technology and away from the content matter which interests us, which is language. And there is a danger in that, right? And it would also mean that, to a certain extent, we would leave behind the traditional humanities field, right? So basically, it's a step into a direction towards engineering and away from the humanities, so our brethren um, traditionally, right? Now, you could argue that that really is a step away from the content matter from language to method, right? So that is definitely, I think, a drawback that could occur. For individual researchers, the um, potentials and drawbacks are slightly different, because there we see that, well, when you, do, when you can program, that means you can become extremely versatile, because you're not bound by the restrictions of tools that you could use, right? You could really be very innovative in um, exploring new territories that would be very, very tough to, um, to use when you are just looking at the tools that are available to you. So you become your own uh, tool creator, right? So become more uh, versatile, and you can put yourself, as Stefan Gries put it, into the uh, driver's seat, right? Um, also, there is an issue of applicability, because then what you could do is you could use your um, your knowledge and apply to other fields. And I think that's also relevant for students, because students basically leave university. And we as researchers tend to see ourselves as, well, all students want to become researchers, like us, right? But that might not be completely true, obviously. Because someday you know, uh, students will leave university and they will have to apply for jobs. And if you can do programming or learn to code, uh, then uh, there are just options for those students that will make it easier on the job market to be employable. So employability is also an issue when you think about uh, programming. And again, also for us as individual researchers, we can make uh, our workflows transparent, but also more efficient, 
because once you have a script written for one analysis, you can basically just copy and paste and take those analyses and apply them to different, um, different uh, analyses. Now, I just want to draw attention again to the fact that the quantitative turn is different from the uh, uh, computational turn, right? So the quantitative turn definitely has taken place and it has affected linguistics. I think we can, it's uncontroversial. The computational turn, not so much. So when we use computation, it's just piggybacking on the back of statistics. Even if you look at textbooks, you see that, right? Now, why, why is programming not an integral part of corpus linguistics when it offers these advantages? Employability, transparency, um, and basically being able to be in the driver's seat, right? Well, well, there are very good reasons for it. So we have these user-friendly tools, and they allow us to do amazing research, I think. So they, they are actually very, very good. They're, sophistic, uh, they're sophisticated, they're flexible, and we can go a very, very long way by using ready-made tools, right? So you could argue, well, I, I'll just use what's there, and that will answer most of my questions. Also, we all know that there's time limits. Right? So we just can scale up at a, um, indefinitely. Right? So if you haven't learned something at the beginning of your career or when you're doing your PhD, it's just tough because there are so many different things that, you, that you're faced with in everyday life that it will be just tough for you. There are time restrictions. Also, what people do sometimes is they source stuff out. Right? So they uh, take um, a statistician or a programmer and then they team up with them and say, well, can you do that job for me? I'll focus on the language side. You, uh, you focus on the programming side, right? It's also completely sensible. And as I mentioned before, there are different interests. So we as linguists typically are interested in language, right? That is our subject matter. And people want to understand what's going on, either with language use or cognitively. So, well, we don't want to deal with computation maybe, right? So there, there are very good reasons why people don't want to focus on programming. I also just put up some things there that can read on the side. So here, for example, it's an explanation when I talk about computation, what I mean by that, and how is it different from programming, right? So programming is just one part of computation, right? It's not only the programming side itself, but also making use of practices and environments and tools that are there that are more commonly used in computation-heavy or data-heavy sciences. Now, as I said, there are very good reasons why corpus linguistics have not fully endorsed uh, programming, right? But which aspects of that have not really been explored to the extent that I think would do justice to the field? Well, I think on the one hand, there's a lack of training resources. It's just very difficult to scale up when it's not super easy to basically look on Google programming linguistics, right? And you find a couple of things there. But overall, even those uh, books that uh, come up when you search on Google, it's essentially quantitative linguistics. So it's statistics, and then we'll teach you programming a little bit on the side. And um, there is another book on Python for, for linguists. As you see um, later on in my survey, Python is actually not our, our, our preferred tool. Most of us actually prefer R, right? So it might actually be where, where people offer resources, but they're not really focusing on what people are acquainted with or what people want to use, right? And in addition to the lack of training, the next issue is, of course, replicability, right? Because, as I said, well, it's kind of difficult when you have uh, many different spreadsheets and you explain what you did to the spreadsheet and the data to really replicate your study. If you have a script, you can just press a button, you run the script on the data, and basically you can reproduce exactly what a person has done, right? And that's an advantage of using um, programming that other things are hard to, uh, to com compete with. Now, let's talk about why I think replication is such a big issue. Well, there is something which is called the replication crisis, and it's an ongoing or controversial ongoing uh, um, phenomenon. Uh, you could also really call it a methodological, a methodological crisis that originated in medicine, but then very, very swiftly spread to other fields in STEM, but also ultimately to the social sciences and psychology. And, <coughs> excuse me, the the problem that occurred was that people tried to replicate studies, really important studies, so studies that were in textbooks, and they couldn't replicate the results. You, know? you might think that's all right, that's the way science is, 
but to a certain extent, you should actually believe that if you read something, that you can trust that. You know, if there's a relationship between X and Y, then you yourself, if you do the same thing on similar data, you should basically get similar results. So what, what is written as knowledge should actually be, be true. Right? And that's not the case. There is a fundamental problem. Right? And now, you could argue that that goes deeper. It's do we consider us as a part of a science? Right? Are we a study or are we science? And if we consider it something like a Sprachwissenschaft, like a, a science of language, then I think it's very clear that when we say something about language, people should be able to trust that, right? to a certain extent at least. And now, what, what really brought the replication crisis into an overdrive was a paper that was published uh, in 2016 um, that presented results of a survey among um, researchers from different domains, more than 1,500 researchers. And um, they were just asked, do you think that there's a methodological crisis? And yeah, more <laughs> than 80% of people said, to a certain extent, yes, there is. So either definitely or yes, there's, there, there's at least a problem, right? And if you basically ask so many people and they respond, yeah, there might be a problem, then uh, you might need to think about that issue. Now. What happened, or what was reported in that, in that paper was that, well, essentially, have you tried to replicate another person's uh, studies or an, another person's experiment? And people actually said, yeah, I tried. And in different fields, um, the replication failure was inc incredibly high. And it's not only for others, uh, other people's experiments, but also uh, for their own, right? So that really points to a problem. But the good thing about that is was that also people were asked, okay, where do you see the problems? Right? So it was the first time really that there was a systematic evaluation of what problems do you think are there in our fields? Right? So now we have an understanding, we have an empirical basis for where are potential problems. And some things that were mentioned were, um, for example, selective reporting, um, that only significant results get published. And I think Tobias mentioned that in, in his paper. We said, well, if we didn't have any significant results, it wouldn't have been published, right? And that's a problem. I, I agree, but that's a problem, right? So uh, we need to think about, you know, that we not only report things that are significant, or you might say that, that have significant results, right? But also, basically, when people find, okay, it's actually not the case, that's equally as important, because that provides information for us. And it also uh, tells us some information, right? If you have two studies, or let's say 10 studies, and one is significant, and that is published, and the other, are not, the other nine are not significant, and they're not published, then that basically skews your vision of what's actually going on, right? Uh, other problems were that, um, that studies had not enough power uh, to detect something, right? And it can, be, can go actually in both directions. You can have a study that is just too small uh, to really give you reliable results, that would be low power. You can also have a study that uses millions of rows uh, and then basically will definitely find effects, right? That's the, that's the repercussion that we have from Kilgore from Greece, and nothing, uh, uh, language is never, ever, ever random, right? So if your n is just large enough, everything will become significant. And that's where people looked at effect sizes, right? Um, another issue is that uh, the methods and code are often unavailable. So you read the paper, uh, but you don't know what exactly happened, right? So the code that was used is just not apparent uh, or available, and you have the same thing with data. So it's not methods only, but also data. And then one thing that is very important to me is that technical expertise required to reproduce was just not there, right? So how do I write scripts? How do I do that? I, I would like to make my work absolutely reproducible, but it's tough to do that, right? So we need training, we need resources and infrastructures to help people deal with that issue. Right? And that's, I think, something that is lacking. Now, you might say, well, yeah, we agree, that's a problem. But no, it's not. Right? Because typically, uh, when we do research, it stays within the confines of corpus linguistics, right? or in our uh, certain disciplines. But the problem is that the replication crisis, sorry, let me switch one further, uh, the replication crisis became public. And people outside of linguistics became aware of that. Right? So that is a major issue. So it's not only us as scientists who are aware of the issue, but also the public is available of the issue. And there's a problem because uh, the public, we, we have a serious problem with trust. Right? So people increasingly lose trust in science. And when I'm not only talking about the fringe who 
are just weird and out there, right? I'm also increasingly talking about uh, a substantive part of the population that are clever, that are intelligent, that are compassionate, right? But if they hear very different conflicting results and they see that actually science itself says, well, our results aren't really reliable, then there is an issue, right? So that is something that we need to address. Uh, address. I'd also like to just talk about certain definitions because it's important. I talk about reproducibility, replication, and robustness. So reproducibility means doing the same study again, exactly the same study. You have the same data, you have the same methodology, you do the same thing, you should get the same results. That's essentially reproducibility. Then you have replication, which means you see something in the paper, you take slightly different data, maybe from, you know, that, that's a different corpus, but, you know, it's drawn from the same population. You apply the same method, and then your results should also be uh, similar. That's replication, because it's not exactly the same data, you apply it to, to a different set of data. And robustness is then, well, you know, if you take many replications, do they point into the same direction? Is there really a signal, right, or is it just noise? And that means that results are robust, right, that you can really trust what's going on there. And then I think we need to also differentiate not between, um, not just these terms, but also between true and formal reproducibility. True reproducibility means that really it's easy for you. It's very easy to reproduce a study. But if you have, for example, data that's uh, somewhere like in a lab and they don't share it, but you can go to the lab and you can use their data, but only in that lab, then it's formally reproducible, but it's not really reproducible, right? So there's a difference between true reproducibility that is basically, it, it's incredibly easy to reproduce something, or formal. Yes, you can do that, but you'll have to go through the multitude of spreadsheets that we've prepared, and you'll find your way to basically replicate what we've done, right? So there's also that problem. Now, what has come out of the replication crisis or issue or problem? Well, as I said, there is a public uh, loss of trust in science. And that's something that we need to, need to address because fundamentally, and in the end, it will affect us. Maybe because our funding is cut or because it's just difficult for us to communicate what we need to communicate, so we need to address that to a certain extent. Now, the good thing is that there um, has been a substantive effort to improve transparency and to make stuff more available and transparent to the public. And I think that's a great thing. And that's a result that came directly uh, out of the replication crisis. So examples are, for example, that certain journals um, require that people send their data and their scripts right, when they've done analysis, or that you basically um, uh, pre-register studies. So regardless of whether they're significant or not, you basically register them beforehand with the journal, and then the journal um, basically says, we're definitely going to publish that, no matter whether the study is significant or not. Right? So that's also something that's important. Also, there's an infrastructure for making your data available in your code. So you have the Open Science Foundation or GitHub, where you can just put stuff, and everybody that can then essentially check what you've done and replicate your stuff. Right? So there's an infrastructure that's already in place, and that's a very, very good thing. Right? It means that we don't have to build the, um, anything from scratch. We can basically take what's already there, and that will make it much, much easier. Right? On the other hand, you know, we we can follow certain steps even without you know, the, the infrastructure that's put in place. Um, we can basically look at how can we ourselves as researchers make uh, research more reproducible. Uh, we can, for example, start by you know, just consistency, by, by naming stuff in a certain way that makes it easy for people to understand. We can uh, use certain fine naming conventions uh, to be able to make stuff searchable uh, in a more efficient way. We can make copies of our data that our data is not lost. Uh, very simple things. We can use the FAIR principles for data sharing, make your data find, uh, findable, interper, interoperable, um, accessible, and recoverable. Right? So basically, sharing data and telling people, I have this data set, this is what it contains. And that's information that's very important. Uh, transparency, they're uh, also something that we can use. We can, for example, use notebooks to just you know, document what we're doing. Uh, and I think most importantly, we can, uh, we can shift our focus a little bit and just become aware of the issue. And then basically, when we submit a paper, to also submit um, the documents that allow other researchers to reproduce what we've done. Right? So reproducibility or a shift in practice is related to considering tr uh, transparency and reproduci uh, reproducibility as a lifestyle. 
right? So as researchers, we, we should think about, okay, how can we um, take part in this communal shift to become more transparent? Right, so as linguists, we're aware of the issue. Um, there are several workshops that have taken place. Um, now journal publications start to emerge that address that issue. Only very recently, the next issue of linguistics will deal, for example, with reproducibility in the quantitative turn. And um, we also see, as I said in journals, that they require that you send the data and the code. So yes, it's great. We, we've, uh, we've started to become aware of that, and we started a discussion. Now let's come to our results, right? So the good news is that almost everybody who took part in the survey says, yeah, rep reproducibility is really something that is important. That's great. That's great. I fully agree. And uh, we're on the same boat there. Now, that was a little bit of a trick question here, because I asked, um, how, how uh, confident are you that you can reproduce or replicate your own studies? And there, everybody was said, yeah, I'm very confident. Right? If, I do, uh, if I replicate my own stuff, I'll, I'll get to the same results. Now, that's a little bit like asking, uh, have you done your homework? Because every student will say, yes, I've done my homework, right? And uh, the way that social scientists try to get a, let's say, um, more truthful answer to the question is, how, how likely um, or do you think the people around you have done their homework, right? And that basically means that you assess, you know, not yourself, but if you say something bad, it doesn't affect you. It affects, you know, the people around you. And so when I asked you, um, how confident are you that you can replicate what other people have done, then it's a complete shift. So from, I'm very confident I can replicate what I did, to, uh, um, yeah, I can't replicate what others do, right? So of course it's easier for us, but you have to consider you are an other for other people, right? So that's exactly how other people view you. Right. Now, the problem, as I said, with reproducibility is that, huh, there are not enough resources. So if you want to learn how to use notebooks or how to use the Open Science Foundation uh, resources, there's just no real books out there that we can use. There are no, um, not many online resources, right? And so let's talk about two um, case studies for infrastructures and the problems they face. So the first thing is that when you want to set up something like that, right, your, um, basically researchers are very different in the level, uh, level of expertise that they have, but also from which uh, field they come. They might be more qualitative or um, interested in pragmatics. They might be fully um, quantitative, right? So you have different levels of expertise. You have different fields where people are coming from. Um, also, you need basically different levels of specificity. You need, for some people, you need very general training. For others, very specific uh, training, right? So for some people, it's how do I learn R, right? And for other people, it's, uh, okay, I have this, um, uh, this regression model and I want to fit it in a different way. How can I do that, right? So you have that issue and then you have um, also the problem that when you do that, the resources that you provide need to be intuitive and easy to use. If they're, if they're too complex, people just won't use it, right? So there's a problem. Now, two, two case studies here, if you like to that, are uh, one lab that I'm involved with, uh, with Michael Hall. Uh, which is the LADAL, it's the Language Technology and Data Analysis Laboratory um, at the University of Queensland. Um, and what we do is essentially we try to offer um, tutorials which show how to learn R, but not how to learn R for the sake of using R, but here are some really cool visualizations that you can use for your data, and this is how you can do them. And so we offer a code and basically show people, okay, if you use this code, this is what happens. Right? And so we try to make it appealing and attractive for people. And at the same time, we, make, we try to basically put it out there in a way where people can just basically, if they have a course, go there and then take stuff from the website and just apply it in their courses. Right? Um, and we cover quite a range of different aspects. So it's not only um, programming or visualizations or stats. It's also, OK, uh, quantitative reasoning. How does it work? What are variables? What are hypotheses? How do I work with texts? Right? Um, how can I, for example, show the networks in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet? Right? So it's basically addressing different aspects of where uh, computing can be important. And you see resource there, and here you see some visualizations that are from the tutorials. Right? And they basically cover quite a range of different things that you can do. What do we aim at? Well, we want to basically uh, improve transparency when working with language data. We also want to enable uh, researchers to basically um, pursue new ways of doing research, right? So really to, to do something that we're not 
able to do before, right? So we really want to enable people. Uh, also, because we know that people struggle with keeping their computers clean and tidy and everything nice, we also try to give guidance on what can you do to basically make it easier for yourself and for yourself to be more efficient in when, when you work with data, right? And of course, you know, we want to show corpus linguists how they can basically interact with other people and where corpus linguistics is important for other uh, related disciplines. Because that is something where I think we're selling ourselves short. Because we have expertise that others are desperate for. And if we're not basically telling other people we can help you with that, then they're not aware of that, especially when you look at literary studies, right? But also uh, in the health sector or in other fields, right? So people actually are interested in working with texts, and we as linguists can, can help with that. All right. Another uh, upskilling platform is the Text Crunching Center at the University of Zurich. And that is slightly different from Nadal, because Nadal is basically um, really focused on the researcher and what they would like to learn, right? Uh, and the Text Crunching Center is more service-oriented. So it will basically consult and help people in basically using big data, right? And basically also uh, pursuing new pathways, but more in a way where they help people in certain uh, projects, right? And you can basically get advice on tools or uh, best practices and help uh, with analyses and also then get um, basically a script that makes it transparent what happened. So it's not just you get a solution, but you also get a solution and you know how it worked and then you can adapt it in the future. Right. Now, just a really brief case study on um, how we as corpus linguists can actually support others. Right. Now, this is a study that was done by myself and Michael Haw and Sam Haynes. It just came out in Big Data and Society. And we wanted to show how corpus linguistics can actually add something to discussions, uh, where basically if you leave the computational people, the software engineers, uh, to do all the analysis, uh, you have a problem because they don't understand language. Right? So we really want to show how can we, as, we as corpus linguists enhance research. Um, and the thing is we want to understand, well, how did the discourse around COVID uh, develop over time? what sub-discourses make up the COVID discourse, and what was the, um, uh, the, the reaction of people within these, uh, within these sub-discourses, right? And the problem was that really um, the existing studies when we started writing the paper was that they were all done by software engineers. And so they treated all discourse as one big bag of words, and they had some fancy tools that they applied to the data, but we know that you know, treating everything as a big bag of words is probably not a very good, accurate way to understand what's really going on, you know, how people respond. You need to break this course down to get a more um, uh, clearer uh, picture of what's going on. So we realized that there were different phases in the, uh, the COVID-19 discourse. Um, specifically, we found that there were seven phases and five different topics. So uh, one international topic, one topic focused on uh, uh, the medical aspects of uh, COVID, one topic that um, was focused on the home and, you know, the effects of uh, the restrictions and stuff like that. So you can really tear out basically what people were talking about and then analyze these different discourses um, different, uh, differently. And we used a 1% sample of all Australian tweets. So it was a quite massive data set, right? And the advantages was that we could really show that we add something to the data. We, you could gain insights that the computational people just could not discover with a bag of word approach, right? So we as linguists can tell people, you can use your methods, that's perfectly fine, but you need to understand what's actually going on with language. And then you can basically come to better or more fine-grained uh, understanding of language. Right. So it's essentially what I said. It's a case study that uh, showed what corpus linguists can add to NLP. Now, the key points here are that uh, corpus linguists have very good reason not to learn programming. I completely get that, right? I, I'm not forcing you or I'm not telling you, you need to learn programming. I think that's the wrong way, right? Because some people are just interested in using tools and basically understanding language. Fair enough, perfectly fine, right? But also, talk to your colleagues and show them you know, how corpus linguistics can maybe enhance literary studies or people in the health sciences and so on. So look outside of your field. I think that you know, we as corpus linguists can be more uh, confident in what we can do to, to enhance others' uh, experiences and research. Um, but also, when you look at corpus linguists, I think we would 
would profit from integrating uh, some practices from other fields, uh, especially when it comes to reproducibility and becoming more versatile. And also with respect to the students, you know, when they, when they speak one program language, it really improves their, um, their job chances. That's something that we as, as, as researchers tend to forget as well, right? There's a real world out there, um, and we have a responsibility for our students, right? But when we want to do that, we need infrastructures, and that comes at a cost, right? Uh, and that's something that we need to address, right? And so it's a communal effort to create these infrastructures. Now, just very briefly for the, fa for the last minute, I'd ponder on and discuss a little bit the quantitative turn and uh, ask corpus linguists, where are we going? Well, there has been a dramatic increase in the number of quantitative uh, studies, right? You see a graph here that I took from uh, Kortmann 2021, so it's just the upcoming issue of linguistics, and you see the number of uh, quantitative studies increases dramatically, right? At the same time, corpus linguistics, you see uh, basically that purely uh, qualitative studies are decreasing. So there's definitely a quantitative turn, and the numbers are pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. And mostly that's positive, but quantitative methods have to be used with care. And that means that we need a better understanding, upskilling in terms of quantitative methodology, but I think we were on a very, very good track, right? Um, also, you could argue, well, there are some people who are not really happy with that development. So it might there have been arguments which basically say, well, we may be shifting too much to method, right? So maybe we should go back, but there is a danger in that, right? By just reforming corpus linguistics to be more language-focused, because what I, what I fear could happen, it's really speculation, but what could happen is that we have a split like uh, a psychology experience did, right? Where you have a split between psychoanalysis on the one hand, that was more sort of akin to the qualitative aspect, and then you have psychology or uh, psychometrics on the other hand, right? And so I think it's very important for our community to basically um, be aware that we have these different um, interests, right? And we should just, you know, be respectful and try to help others and um, maybe, you know, team up more in the future. Right. Now, as I said, linguists are aware that there's an uh, issue with reproducibility, but we've known that for a very long time. So here we see, for example, a paper from 2010 saying, yeah, we need to be replicable, right? So we're aware of that issue for a long time now. Um, but when we look at what's actually going on, the first workshop started in 2016, right? Or 2018 even. So we really take that discussion up and talk about it at conferences and in publications. That's a very, very recent phenomenon. So what I, what I think is important that we continue that discussion because it's not just enough to provide something. People need to be aware that that's useful, right? So that's what the discussion is for, to basically show people, okay, here's what we need and this is why it's good for you, right? Or good for us, let's put it this way, right? Uh, and it also makes sense not to become computational linguists, right? I fully agree, that's, that's not our aim, that's not what we want or what most people want. But there are aspects um, that would help us if we adopted them. Like, for example, the resources that are out there, right? Like the um, notebooks and sharing data and as a community be, um, becoming more akin to having culture of sharing, right? Uh, uh, research and also scripts. And also, yeah, we need to put some efforts into resources like um, writing books on how to, how to help people with computation, right? So what I see here is, yes, we as corpus linguists can contribute um, to other sciences. So we, need to, we don't need to like, be afraid of being, um, being competing with natural language processing and computer science. It's sometimes that we, um, that we think, well, you know, we're not on the same level. They're, they're doing something different. It's really, we can contribute, and we can basically reach out. And I, um, my experiences are very positive, that people will also reach out to us, right? And, and see that what we do is actually helpful for them too. All right. So thank you very, very much for listening, and uh, thanks to the organizers for setting this up. Yeah.